Hello, good afternoon to all. In the next few slides, we are going to have a great opportunity to see and hear two representatives of today's event sponsor, ISAQB. I'm honored to announce our next speaker, Dr. Carola Lilienthal. Dr. Lilienthal is the managing director of Workplace Solutions in Germany. For over 20 years, she has been conducting projects in agile manner with her development teams. She is a passionate software architect, constantly on her mission to improve, learn, and share, share her knowledge. Today, Dr. Lilienthal, or Carola, as she likes to be called, is going to talk about domain storytelling. The talk is aimed at everyone involved on interested in software development, including non-technical people. And with any further ado, Carola, floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Valida. Um, it's now, and this will all work out in a second. Here I am in, in large. Wow, now, perfect. Okay, hi everybody. I'm very, very happy to be here and to talk to you today about um, a wonderful topic that I love a lot, even um, I, uh, even if I am normally known as a software architect, I um, have done a lot of um, software projects and domain storytelling helped me a lot to build high quality software by understanding um, our users. And this is sort of the title of this talk. Mm -hmm. So um, I will have a little introduction to get you a bit into the scene. Then I will present myself with two slides and then we will go into the details of this method. Um, so imagine um, now that we are all here, um, um, that we are in the deepest winter and um, we are looking into a cave where a prehistorical clan of, of, um, of people is sitting around the campfire in their cave. And outside, the snow is falling and the storm is holding. And the old women have wrapped themselves up in heavy beer furs. And the children are snuggling into their mother's arms. And then one of the warriors stand up and he says, um, Dear brothers of the tribe, oh, yes, I know the winter is cold, but have no fear, there will be no hunger this winter because all the hunters of our tribe have hunted for this long and cold winter. And um, uh, we have hunted uh, a, a huge um, bison um, in the steppes and we have followed the herd of these bisons for days and with a trick we were able to separate one of them from the group and we rushed him into a trap and with our spears, we threw at him and we fought. And finally, um, we, we were able to kill him. And now we have enough to eat for the winter. And at that moment, um, the children and the whole tribe heard that someone was scratching on the wall. And they turned their heads and they saw um, that Aga, this skillful tool master, was standing at the wall and... Wow, what a wonder. He was he has put the bees on, on the wall and the warriors too. And the children they whisper, "Oh, there it is. We can see the bees on and the hunters." And this was of course 16,000 years ago. Ago, excuse me. And we are still there. We are still we can still look at the painting in the cave and at this early piece of art, and we are still doing this. We love, we still love paintings, pictures, to understand things, to understand what is going on. So we, the modern um, human beings, we are still doing like that. We are sparkling a fire, we are telling stories, and we are painting pictures. And that is what domain storytelling is all about. These days, of course, we are not gathering in a cave, um, but we are in a meeting room or we are like today in a video session. And the campfire we are sitting around is today typically a whiteboard 
or if you are virtually together, a Miro board, a Miro board that you might use in your daily work. And we are sitting there and the user is the user or the domain expert, however you will call them, he is telling us his story and um, we are putting them down in pictures. And these pictures today are drawn on whiteboards, on modeling spaces. And the guy you can see here is my good friend and colleague Henning Schwentner, who was supposed to give this talk, but he, he didn't have time today. He had to do something else. He's not here today. And um, this guy here um, is uh, Stefan Hofer, who is as well a good colleague of mine. And um, um, there you can see how he puts a story like that on the wall. He is not here today either. Um, and um, both of them, Henning and Stefan, I'm, I'm going to wait until this little video ends. Um, discussion with the people, putting things on the wall. Right, perfect. So now we're going to see that he, he's doing something down there. And this is it. So both of them, not Henning and not Stefan, are here today. But they are both the authors of the book Domain Storytelling. And um, if you have never seen it, look at it. Um, it's as well um, available um, uh, virtually. <laughs> you don't have to buy it. And it's, it will tell you everything about domain storytelling. Um, so now, now it's about me because you have to deal with me. I have studied computer science in the 90s. I did a lot of software development. I started as a project manager, architect and consultant around 2000. And I wrote my doctor thesis on, on complexity of software architecture. And since then, um, I have written some books. You can see them here. And I have made this a business in my company. We are looking at legacy software. Um, and we are trying to help people to get this legacy software into a good maintenance mode again and to cut it into pieces. And this is where domain storytelling comes into the play again, because with domain storytelling, um, we, are, um, we have a great tool to divide legacy software into smaller modules. And I will talk to you about that as well in this talk. My company is called Workplace Solutions. Uh, we started in 2000 with, with 12 developers, and now we are 140 um, people in our company. Um, we, we love to, to meet each other again after the long COVID time, as, as all of us but we are doing a lot of things virtually as well. And our main focus is to develop software for, for various kinds of customers with a strong focus on usability and architecture. And um, now we will dig into domain storytelling and I hope I can relate it a bit to your field of expertise testing because of course, domain storytelling, usability and architecture, they all only work if we have a great team of testers um, integrated into our software development that help us um, to create high quality software. So why is domain storytelling important for tech people? And I sub some uh, testers and everybody who is not user or domain expert under tech people. So it's you as you too, you are tech people from my point of view. Well, to build software, uh, us, the tech people, we have to understand the business people. This is necessary because if we don't understand them, they will not get the software that they, that they need. Um, there is a wonderful um, uh, saying of uh, Alberto Brandolini, and he said, the source code only shows the, the understanding of the, the developers, not the requirements that were described in the backlog, or in the backlog items. And I would uh, incorporate the testers here as well. The source code in high quality tested only shows the understanding of the developers and the testers. Um, it's not what is written down in the backlog. So, uh, and one technique that uh, domain storytelling is strongly connected with that helped us to, to, get, to, to get into this understanding is domain storytelling. You might have heard about domain storytelling. Um, domain storytelling tells us how to build software 
um, uh, that is founded in the domain. So the basic idea of domain story storytelling is to create software um, that is that is very very close to the actual original problem, and um, this means that the software should ref be a reflection of the domain, and um, this is only possible if our domain experts um, tell tell us um, what the domain is about, and we understand this this idea what the what the users are doing what the domain experts are thinking about their domain and we transfer this understanding into software so the second error is a is as well a very difficult thing our understanding to put it into play um, uh, to program it and um, to uh, to understand uh, the domain knowledge um, we have to get it out of the head of our our domain experts. And um, the important story here is that we want to get, with domain storytelling, we want to get away from the telephone game where the user is telling the business analyst what he is thinking and the business analyst is, uh, is um, under, understanding something, hopefully the good thing, and transferring that to the testers and the, the developers um, in the chain and on, each step, some knowledge gets get lost. Um, we really want to get back to direct communication where everybody is involved. And um, uh, this um, uh, needs to be done in a language um, that the users will understand. We do have to do um, this um, communication in a language that the domain experts know and understand. If not, we will suffer from the model monopoly. This is a well-described problem in psychology, actually. If you use a notation to transport your understanding of something that another person has said, um, the domain expert, of course, and you use um, a notation that only you know, and then you have the monopoly on the model. So a model like this, this is, of course, extreme, but the underlying message of the model monopoly is if you show a model to someone in a notation that is new to this, to this person, um, it is very difficult for the other person to understand this model. The, the notation you are using for the model is a new language that the user would have to learn to understand and to give feedback. Um, this will re result normally in a feedback like, oh, yeah, this looks good. Wow, this is so complicated. I see you have thought a lot about it. And then you end up with a software system that does not fit the needs of your users at all. So how do we get to commun communicate? How do we get to a communication um, where um, the, our understanding of, of what the user has said um, is again understood by the user. And um, domain-driven design uh, and me too, we recommend um, to explore the domain together with the users and the developers in a workshop. And domain storytelling is exactly the technique that facilitates this approach. I will show you now. Um, domain storytelling is conducted with a group of domain experts, a facilitator, of course, business analysts, development teams, testers. And this is um, in contrast to an interview where, where usually only one domain expert is present. Uh, domain storytelling brings together everyone who knows something about the domain. And um, domain storytelling focuses on one question. Uh, the question is who exchanges what with whom and why do they do that? So the focus is on actors. You, you see the little icons here, the little um, um, man and, and the computer system. So the focus is on actors, who is doing something, um, what they exchange, uh, information or some documents or whatever, um, and the purpose of their collaboration, the why, which is very important. Um, domain storytelling can be done 
uh, in the real world, like you have seen on a whiteboard, or virtually with Miro, Miro or um, there's as well an open source tool called Egon um, that you can use for domain storytelling. You will see uh, some more of that later. And the output, uh, the result of domain storytelling are diagrams of these stories, um, glossaries, if you want. Um, it's very easy to create glossary entries out of um, domain stories I will show you. And the so-called Y tables, um, where, where we are noting for each step um, with what goal it is performed, because this is so important. If you want to do digitalization, if you want to create a new software, a new work, work uh, environment with new processes, which is very normal if you have a new software, um, then you have to understand why did they do this before and how will I replace this in the next um, software system? So let's have a look. I told you actors, Okay, working items, and then they do something with, with, uh, with the working items and the actors exchange something, and there are sequence numbers, uh, of course, so that you can follow the whole process. And I will show you a domain story now, um, a very basic thing that you might have all done in your life already. It's about opening an account in a bank. So let's start. What do we see here? There is the bank clerk and the customer. And the first step in this process is that the customer identifies himself with his, his ID uh, to the bank clerk. And um, this is the important first step so that the, the bank clerk can go on. And he fills in something that he calls AOA. Oh, this is the first moment. He's talking like this. Our domain expert is the bank clerk. And he says, well, I'm, I have to fill in an AOA. And um, the question is, well, what is this? Well, an AOA is an account opening application. This is what the clerk uh, explains to us. And this is something that we should absolutely put into our glossary. So um, all the working items um, the, the, that you can see in the process, they will have to go into the glossary um, so that we um, get a, a proper um, understanding of all the um, the working items that they are using. Okay, so we will we will put it as account account opening application um, here in our diagram so that we don't have to translate all the time. And the next step is that the bank clerk prints out the account opening application and uh, presents it to the customer for a signature. Okay, uh, we understand all that. And what happens next? Well, what happens next is um, that in Germany, the bank clerk um, has to check the credit worth, worth, worthiness of the customer with a general credit protection ag agency. Wow, um, this is weird. Um, well, um, there is a why now. You can see the why. Why do they do that? Well, even for opening an, an account in a bank, uh, the regulations in the bank require that the credit worthiness is checked. And there is um, a spelling um, mistake on the slide, but I will I will repair that later. So um, now we know why he's doing that. And the next step is um, that the bank clerk order uh, sends an order uh, for the creation of um, of a, a credit card, or in this case, a European um, credit card, to the card manufacturer. And of course. Um, if you see that step, you understand that it's important to ask for the credit worthiness and that there's a rule in the bank to do that. Next step after that is that this um, credit card, this uh, European credit card, is sent by mail to the customer. So he re will receive this card and he will receive as well um, the number, the PIN number to, to, um, to use the credit card, actually. So um, um, if we um, have recorded this process, um, uh, then at some point um, there, there comes the question, well, uh, we this is how they work now, but if we want to 
have some more digitalization, we have to redesign this process. We want to, we want to create some software for that, uh, printing out uh, uh, account opening application and all that. Well, we are in modern times. Can't we do it differently? And in this example, um, we will do this for the area on the left, uh, for this uh, part of the story, um, the red box. So this part of the process, the bank clerk and the customer, we want to find a more digital solution here um, because today people, uh, it, it's difficult to find the bank clerk actually because in Germany they reduce their, their um, 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 bank clerk, um, um, uh, the magazine is the wrong word. Um, so um, uh, the, the bureau where you can find them, they are reducing it more and more. So um, why can't we do it online? And um, this is the next step then. We have modeled the actual situation, what they are actually doing, and we can start to do a second story, a, a second domain story to imagine the future process. So the, the future process might be like this. If you look down where the customer is, that the customer fills in an account opening application online. So he doesn't have to visit the bank clerk at all. And then he, he sends his digitally signed uh, account opening application into this online portal and uh, loads up his ID. And then the whole process um, works as it did before. Um, he will get his credit, his European credit card, his PIN number and everything. So um, with domain stories um, about the future, um, we, we can already see how this future system uh, should be used and, and whether um, it will work compared to the old process. So you will be able to write down test cases from this story. You will be able to write down acceptance criteria as well from this story. So the story um, for the target model for the future will help you um, to create um, uh, um, test, test utilities, test cases and everything. Um, to, to get one step further um, in this whole uh, thinking about understanding the domain and so on, I already talked about the glossary and about the need that we understand the language of the users. And um, uh, what domain-driven design told us is that, well, be aware, be aware of uh, the fact that the user and the domain experts, that they speak a different language than we do, us, the techies. So um, the domain experts, they speak domain lingo and we speak some technical uh, language. And of course, it's not a good idea. I showed you with the mo model monopoly already that we try to force our domain experts to understand our language because then the, the solution, the result, the, re the resulting software will not really help them. What we have to do is we have to understand the language of the user and um, of course not the whole, not everything they talk about, but that part that is important for our software that we're going to map into our software system, this part um, we ha really have to understand and um, when we, um, what happens then in the software? Well, what will we stick to our technical terms in the software? No, uh, domain-driven design and domain storytelling as well tells us to um, have uh, the domain language, the domain-specific terms um, in the software as the user are using them. And this is really something that testers can help software developers with and business analysts, of course, as well, um, to be really stay focused on the language of the users. Because it's so often, it's so easy that, pe that people create new terms, new, new words for something from the domain. So um, the idea here is that we need a ubiquitous language to really understand each other, a common language that we use in all communications. When we speak when we write emails, when we create diagrams like domain stories and as well in the code and basically everywhere. And this is why um, in domain-driven design, this uh, language is called 
ubiquitous language. It's everywhere, the, the ubiquitous language. This is our goal. We have to, that, this is where we have to go. And when we have, when we create a ubiquitous language, uh, this is our, our best uh, weapon to prevent the model monopoly that I talked to you about before. How can we do all this now? I showed you the technique. I talked to you about what we can gain from it. Uh, how can we do it? Well, of course, a workshop format um, um, that I showed you already to be in a room or, or in, a, in a, a video conference. And uh, what you need in, a, in a, a meeting like that is you need a storyteller. This is Henning's father on this um, picture. And you, you need listeners. You need someone who, who uh, is listening to the story. And of course, the storyteller is usually the domain expert. Um, I hope that you are aware of the fact that in some companies, the software developer who developed the old system tend to know more about the system than the domain experts because they know all the little uh, tricks and, and all the little um, uh, fields to fill in. But if you want to create a new software, you have to understand how the domain expert uh, is working with the system, how he's doing it. So normally we, developers and testers, we are the listeners. And hopefully um, the user will tell us a, a story, a real story, their story, and not some fairy tale about things and, and bits and pieces, but the real story. Um, and there are techniques, questions yet that you can learn from Henning's book or from any uh, moderator um, training how to uh, to pose open questions to really get uh, a complete story and not all the misunderstandings and problems that the user has with the story. So why are you doing it? This is a very important question. What are you doing with whom and why? And I hope um, um, that you are aware of a fact that is it's quite easy that we think we understood, but in fact, um, uh, we misunderstand our our users uh, very often. Um, you you have different modes how you can do a workshop with domain storytelling. You can uh, do it uh, moderated. So one person is standing in front of the the uh, the, the whiteboard or or this board here, and he is painting everything, organizing everything. This is much easier for the moderator, of course. But because he he can think think about the whole um, story on one wall, but for the people in the room, for the storyteller and all the others, um, it's quite of a danger because they lay back and they they ask the moderator to do the whole thing. So you can do it as well in cooperation. You can ask uh, the people to put their um, their icons themselves on the wall. You can ask them. Um, um, to ask questions directly on the board and to change things. This is a different kind of moderator um, uh, um, workshop um, where, where not every where not just one person is allowed to 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 work on the board. Um, tools. Well, in the beginning we did PowerPoint. Um, we have a little tool um, open source um, that our company created that is called uh, Egon, and you can find it under. Egon IO, and if you find any problems in there, please uh, go to GitHub, please uh, contact us, uh, <laughs> repair it yourself, whatsoever. We are all the time trying to, to um, improve this version. And, and the nice thing about this tool is that you we have a stepper in there, the thing that is in red here. So you can uh, see the story step by step, and you can show it step by step to your users. Um, you can do it on whiteboards. We even created a set of typical cards. You know, I think you can download that uh, posted um, 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 idea on on the website of the of the tool. Um, you can even do it on on big screens and and paint everything. So I mean, you're really free where you do it, how you do it. Um, the, I, I often do it in my little book when someone tells me a story. And I, I want to want to memorize it. I do it like a domain story, and like that, I understand. Um, important thing in here: the scope. Um, 
if you start to do a domain story, you're often getting um, basic uh, little bits and pieces. And uh, I want you to, to be of, aware that, that there are scope factors. So there is a question of granularity. I will show you in a moment. There is a question of point in time and domain purity. These three um, scope factors um, you should know. The first one, granularity. Um, you can have a domain story that is coarse grained, so it's the big picture without all the details, or you can have uh, domain stories that are, that are fine grained, where you discuss little pieces of, of the process that a person is doing at her desk. And in the end, to create a good software, you have to go into this um, fine grain area. But um, uh, in the beginning, it's often good to do a, a, a big picture. I will show you in a second. Um, next is the point in time. Do I speak about the as is, the, the actual model, how they work today? Or do I speak about how it should be, the to be? We um, uh, always start with the as is because it's very difficult to speak about the future, the target, the to be, if you have not understood how they work today. So uh, very, very often people forget about the actual work situation and they, they jump into the future right away. Uh, be, be careful. This is really dangerous to do that because if you have not understood why the people are working how they work now, you create ideas of a future workplace um, that will not help your users afterwards. Um, so I prefer uh, a paper who explains what, how they are doing it now and what they want to achieve than uh, all fancy uh, ideas about the future. A little different story a uh, little, little different view. You can as well look at the now. You can look at some optimizations that you're doing. You can look at uh, a domain story with the new system. The important point is just that you know where you are in time, you know, when you're doing it. So, and the last point about the scope factor is domain purity. This is an important point. Um, very often when we start, the people tell us, well, and then I use this system and I put this into this system, this data, and I press the, the save button and then I send it and so on. This is a digitalized domain story. The people are talking about the systems. The systems are actors in the story. And um, this is very normal in the beginning. But if you want to create a new idea for a different type of a solution in software. You need the pure story. You need the story where you can see what they are doing without software. So um, this, the pure story of this thing I did before, um, the user, I, I put this data into this system is, well, what are you actually doing? I'm filling in an, an account opening application. This is what I'm doing. Um, and I'm sending an order to someone. This is what, what is the pure domain story. And I will show you now a big picture, pure domain story for the bank process uh, with the customer. Um, we have seen this bit already. I've just uh, shrank it a bit because I, I took away the, the credit card production and all that. So what do you see here? Uh, you see um, that the customer uh, identifies himself with the ID to the bank clerk. The bank clerk fills in the application opening, uh, the account opening application, and then he prints it and the customer signs that application. Okay, this is what they do in the beginning. And then the customer starts to use its, its account and he is depositing some amount of money into his account and he is transferring uh, some money from his account to another account for another customer. And um, then there is of, as well some, some story uh, where the um, account manager, uh, the, the customer um, at the end of the year, he receives some interest. Uh, for some time we didn't receive any interest, but now we will come back to that uh, state in time. So the bank clerks will restart to calculate annual interest rates and um, for our account and we will receive the money. 
Okay, so this is a big picture um, domain story that is pure. And now I will show you why we do this um, um, if we want to divide a legacy system into uh, smaller modules. And this is a domain-driven design idea um, that I think testers and other people should know because this will, will help you to understand what a software team is actually heading to um, in dividing a legacy software. Domain-driven design has created this idea of strategic design. Our software system supports users in their work in a domain. And domain-driven design tells us this in a, that in a domain above a certain size, also, um, like our banking example, there should be subdomains. Uh, you should find subdomains and um, uh, uh, that these subdomains will help us to divide our software into something um, that um, uh, domain-driven design calls bounded contexts. So uh, each bounded context sets explicit boundaries for individual domain-oriented parts um, in the software and as well, and this is the interesting point, in the team organization. So one team for one bounded context for one subdomain. This is, this is great, isn't it? Um, uh, and we do all this only with one goal, to create a high coercion and loosely coupled um, bits and pieces, bounded contexts that don't need anything for anyone for, from any of the other bounded contexts and they, that they are together to fulfill the, their work. And in this process of the bank, I will show you now these bounded contexts and we can see um, what this means. So um, we can uh, identify down here this um, bounded context interest calculation, which is the bank clerk doing basically at his um, at his work, um, in his work area without talking to the customer. The customer only sees the result on his account. Then um, there is the payment transaction bounded context. This is all about money on the bank account. This is the daily um, use of the account that the, um, the customer would, um, would have. And then um, there is this bounded context um, about the account opening. And if we can identify this on this a very high granular um, level, this is a big picture domain story, not very detailed, we can dig into these um, bits and pieces into these bounded contexts and find out what part of our legacy software actually belongs together. And the testers later can create test cases just for this bit and not for everything in the whole um, system that we can find there. Um, there are some heuristics how to cut a system into these bits and pieces. Um, uh, how to cut a legacy software. You can cut it according to the business processes. This is what you have seen just then with the big picture of the bank. Um, there are boundaries of the business processes. The, the account opening is the, um, the first thing that the, the domain experts will, will talk to us about and some other domain expert might talk to, about, to us about the interest calculation. Um, you have seen there is some sort of flow of information. If the account is not created, the, the customer cannot have some money in, uh, put onto his account or do transfer or anything like that. So the numbers indicate some kind of um, information flow. Um, the, the, the three different um, bounded contexts that we have created there for the bank, they have different rhythms. Um, the, the, um, the account opening is done once in the beginning. The transferring of money is done all the time. And the interest calculation is done once a week. Um, so different process triggers as well uh, lead us into that. And... Um, other things that we have not seen here are um, the user, uh, the, 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 the key concepts in the domain might be used differently in this different um, bounded context. And um, we, we might have uh, different kinds of departments in our organization that work differently um, with our software. So 
to sum up, I will do the sum up now, what I have tried to transport to you today in this, um, this talk. Um, what is domain storytelling helping us with? Well, domain storytelling helps us to discuss and understand the domain and the actual situation of our users. Who is doing what uh, and why? So we can understand the, the actual situation um, that they are working in. And I told you already that this is the, the real foundation to create a new um, new software system or a new software solution. The second thing is that we can understand and model the user's language as a ubiquitous language in a, in a glossary, for example. So uh, we will, if they, if they tell us, if they uh, talk to us about their, their stories, what are they doing, how, are you, they are, how they are starting their day, what they are doing uh, during their daytime with their customers, with colleagues, we will uh, get very close to their language when we use domain storytelling and we put there the actors and the working items and the, the activities. So this helps us a lot to create a good glossary. Um, then with I have showed you that we can have one domain story about the actual situation and one domain story about the future situation. So we can discuss if we have understood the actual situation very easily, our ideas with the users, because in the end, it's the team of software developers, business analysts and testers who will create the new solution. They will, um, uh, will have an idea how to digitalize what the user is doing now. And um, with, a, with a slightly changed domain story, you can show the user how his work will change and the user can react on that. Um, we will, with domain story, we will be able to understand the needs of the future solution and derive test cases and acceptance criteria from these um, uh, domain stories that, that, that we have created for the future situation. So um, we can really use them in the development process as a documentation of our discussion with the, with the domain experts and transfer them into into the things that we need in Jira or in, in, in our test uh, environment where we write down our test cases um, and we can refer to the domain stories. If we want to cut the software into bounded contexts because we have a legacy software and we can't replace it with a new system, well then as well, um, we will use domain stories to find these bounded contexts and to, to, to align the team organization with a new um, bounded context that we found. So domain storytelling will help us with that. And something uh, that I have not talked about, but that we should see a lot with our customers. Uh, if you have domain stories for the work as it is done actually at the moment or in the future, it will be much easier to explain to new employees how to do the work, how they should do the work, what will come in the future, um, how the work will change. And this is important for new domain experts, for business analysts that come into the team, for testers, and of course, for developers. All of them, if you explain them how domain storytelling works, um, it's much, much easier to understand quickly uh, what the whole work environment is about. And I hope I, I was able to show you that, that domain storytelling actually is easy to use. You can do it in your book, on a paper. Um, and I hope um, if you need some um, support, um, you can talk to me, of course, but you can talk as well uh, to Henning and Stefan. They love to, um, to explain how to use domain storytelling and help people uh, to work with that. And I hope this little talk inspired you a bit uh, to try it out. And um, now we have some time left for questions. I'm happy to answer whatever kind of question you have. Um, and um, thank you very much for listening. It was, I was really enjoying listening to you. <laughs> thank you, Valida. Well, uh, I'm not coming from this branch, but somehow I'm I feel sad for that because it was, <laughs> it was really uh, 
yeah you you just show that that it can be easy as well yes this is what i wanted i That's have as well described the process how to get a certification with domain stories i mean you know the, yes, the work yes. in your company you can do that it's very easy it's quick and yeah thank you so, for that so i'm happy thank you for now there are no further questions but, but okay. there are uh, so many comments some oh. of them are saying thank you dr lilienthal for this uh, vivid presentation and uh, the other one i really like how you pointed out how important it is to know where you are where you are on the timeline instead yes. make fancy production and planning yeah. so so uh, once again thank you if there are no further questions there are not However, as you already stated, uh, anyone who is interested can contact uh, you directly or Henning yes. or Stefan. Yes. yes. Which, or, of course, uh, they, uh, you can send, for all of you who are listening now, you can send questions to APOQ and we are going to be more than happy to forward them to Lilienthal and let you know the answers. Yes. And you can send me uh, emails as well or on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter. It's no problem. I mean, I'm I'm findable in the internet, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's no problem. And if I don't answer directly, just uh, wait a second and send your email again. Uh, sometimes it's just too much. You know, there are too many emails. And if you if you insist, I will answer, you know, sometimes I just, it just moves through my, my email inbox and I'm, uh, sometimes it happens. So don't worry if I don't answer, just trigger me again. The second time will absolutely always work. <laughs> yeah. So the recommendation is to insist and yes, just repeat the question. Yes, this is it. Thank you very much for, for this presentation. Thank you for being us uh, with us today. and. It was a pleasure. It, it was our pleasure as well. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.